Okay. Um, I'm delighted to say that uh, we're getting down to the end. Um, and I'm sure you're happy to hear that, too. Um, this is the uh, last week in which uh, you will see uh, new material. So we have two lessons from uh, Chapter 6 on uh, integration, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then... Um, next week, uh, I'll be spending class time doing some review. I'll be going over the uh, practice final exam uh, uh, um, after that. Um, let's see what's going on here. Oh, getting someone admitted. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Uh, one thing I want to point out about the um, final exam, uh, just like with the previous two tests, there is a practice exam uh, that's already out there. And I strongly urge you to take it, as I have with the previous test. But one difference is uh, the practice final counts for extra credit. So again, it's optional, like the other ones, you don't have to do it. But you have an extra incentive to do so this time. Um, you get unlimited attempts, like before, so your best attempt will count for extra credit up to 4%. So if you ace it, you get 4% added to your overall grade. Um, also, um, if your final exam score is, uh, is not the lowest, uh, so if it, if it beats either your test one or test two, then it will replace that, that lowest test. Uh, so if you do well on it, then it can help your grade um, even more. So things to keep in mind as we get down to the end. Um, so um, the and one thing I want to confirm here as I look at the um, practice final. I made it way back in August, so um, <clears throat> a lot has happened since then. Okay, uh, final exam, fall 2020. So um, I want to check the settings on it also. Um, Just to make sure I'm not giving you wrong information. OK. There are a total of uh, 20 problems um, on the final. The final is not, I repeat, not comprehensive. Um, it will only have material from uh, uh, last week's lessons on uh, chapter five, five three, and five four, and then the two lessons uh, from uh, from this week. Okay. All right. Um, well, one thing I do need to fix about it in Hawks, um, I had set it for uh, two hours, but it should be two and a half. There's more problems, so I want to give you more time. All right. So I fixed that. Um, okay. All right, um, so now uh, time to get into this last topic. Um, so so that, that after these lessons, you are hopefully literally going to know uh, differentiation uh, backwards and forwards. Uh, the forwards part is what you've been doing all semester. Now we're um, doing differentiation uh, in reverse. So. Um, OK. So I need to give some uh, definitions first, like here are the lessons about the indefinite integral. So what is that? The indefinite integral of a given function f of x is 
function big f of x such that if you take the derivative of big f, um, then you get uh, little f. Um, now, another term for big f an antiderivative of little f. So, uh, so the idea here is, it's like you basically you're given the derivative and you're trying to backtrack to the original function. So certain differentiation rules that uh, you've been using all semester long are now going to be uh, reversed. So to give you that, um, now before I get into those, um, One thing to keep in mind is, and this will be very important when entering answers in Hawks, the antiderivative, unlike the derivative, is uh, not unique. Um, so as an example, um, Let's let the f of x equal to 2x. So if I were to ask you, um, so if a little f is 2x, you're trying to find the indefinite integral of little f, which is big F. And by the definition, its derivative has to be 2x. So someone tell me, what is a function whose derivative is 2x? x squared? Yes. Um, so that works because, as you know, uh, its derivative is 2x. Um, Now, can anyone think of um, another function that's not exactly, it's not exactly the same as this one, whose derivative would also be 2x? So it's gonna be something similar. I'll give you a hint. You can, if you were to add something to x squared, so that when you took the derivative, you would get 2x for the x squared, and then whatever you added on to x squared, its derivative would be 0. So in other words, it wouldn't change anything. The derivative would still be 2x. So what's a function that has a derivative of zero? A constant? Yeah. So if I just pick one, so so, so for example, uh, um, x squared plus five, uh, because if I take a derivative of this, I'll get 2x from the x squared. Derivative of 5 will be 0, so the derivative will still be uh, x squared. So the indefinite integral of, x, of 2x is fx equals x squared plus capital C. And C is used to refer to 
an arbitrary constant. Um, because I could add on any constant to x squared, and when I take a derivative, I'm still going to get 2x. So this describes all possible antiderivatives of little f. Um, so, so this is how we describe the indefinite integral. So when you have a problem like this first one, where you give it a function and you ask for the indefinite integral of it, um, go ahead and work it out using what approach I'll show you. And then don't forget to tack on this plus C at the end or Hawks will mark it wrong and then you'll be kicking yourself. Um, so, so, be, so be sure to get in the habit of including that um, on these. Okay. So how do we actually get antiderivatives? We, it's helpful to have rules for getting them, just like you have rules for taking derivatives. So the most important one that we'll see is based on the power rule for derivatives. That derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. So, um, so, where's, so that's a derivative of x to the n. What's the antiderivative of x to the n? So it'd be like reversing this process. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the power rule in another form that'll help us see what the um, antiderivative will be. Because we want to find whatever function goes on the left side so that on the right side, after taking a derivative, we have x to the n. So uh, all right, so what I'm going to do first is throughout, I'm going to replace n with n plus 1. Why? Because I want x to the n over here, but I don't have it. I have x to the n minus 1. So I'm just going to replace n with n plus 1 on both sides. So the power rule would still hold. So then I have x to the n plus 1 is equal to n plus 1. And then I'll have x to the n, because I'd have n plus 1 minus 1, which would give me n. All right, this helps, but I want to I have x to the n by itself on this side, and I'm almost there. So what I need to do now is divide both sides by n plus 1, because if I multiply a function by a constant, the derivative is multiplied by that same constant. Now if I have x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, then I'll have x to the n. So by rewriting a power rule, because this is equivalent to a power rule, um, I have a function whose derivative is x to the n. So now here's how I, watch how I write this. I use this symbol. This is an integral sign. Um, so when you see this, it's kind of like similar to having a d over dx here. It indica indicates that whatever follows, we're taking the integral of. And then after the function that you're taking the integral of, we have as dx. Um, the reason for this is it indicates that we are taking the antiderivative with respect to x, just as you're taking a derivative with respect to x. 
Um, so it's meant to indicate what variable is changing. Um, and that is equal to x to v n plus 1 over n plus 1. And then don't forget the plus c. Um, and this is the power rule for integration. So we have two power rules, uh, one for derivatives, one for integrals. And uh, they're just reverses of each other. So just as of derivatives, you multiply by the exponent and then subtract one from the exponent. Now we're unwinding all of those steps. So if x to the n, you want the antiderivative, you add one to the exponent, then divide by the exponent. So you can see how everything is opposite uh, from before. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so whenever you have uh, integral of um, the power of x, uh, this is what you have. But there's one situation in which this rule cannot be used. Um, so when might this expression not be defined? If n equals negative one. Yeah, so if n is equal to minus one, we're dividing by zero. Um, so, so it does not apply in that case, it does apply in all other cases. Um, this case where n equals minus one, I will get to that momentarily. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so this is the rule for taking integrals we'll be using most often. Um, Here's some other one, other rules. OK, um, first, uh, these are similar to rules for derivatives, which makes sense because they're just going backwards. Um, so uh, if you multiply a function by a constant, then you are allowed to pull constant factors out and just work on what's left. Um, also, if you have a sum, um, you can <clears throat> take the integral of the two parts individually and then add the results together. All right, so this is just like a, with a linearity of a derivative, but um, you can. So constant factors are sum and sums are, are pretty easy to handle. Um, we are not going to have a counterpart to the product, quotient, or chain rules. Um, there are such counterparts, at least for product and um, chain rule, but we're not covering those in, in, in this course. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I want to address this case of uh, n equal to minus 1. So that would be x to the minus 1, which is the same as 1 over x. So there is a rule for that. It's the natural log. And I have to include the plus c. Um, because the derivative of natural log, as you saw two lessons ago, is 1 over x. Note that I put the absolute value here. Um, so very important when you um, use this. Uh, in problems, when you enter your answer in Hawks, do not forget the absolute value or it will mark it wrong. Um, and um, just as e to the x is its own derivative, it is also its own antiderivative. And there's a Variation of this rule that will be used very often. Um, suppose instead of e to the x, you have e to the cx, where c is a constant. Uh, that's very similar. You just have to remember to divide by the coefficient of x. Right. 
So this is going to come up in several problems, so be sure to keep this in mind. Um, and actually, I think this pretty much will cover the rules that we'll need um, in, in, in this lesson anyway. <clears throat> OK. So, so what I'll do is I'll um, start going through the problems. And uh, since we're dealing with something that's um, quite new here, if you have any questions as we go, um, you know, uh, feel free to interrupt. So basically, we're going to be seeing all the rules that you see right here. We're now going to uh, put to use. So a lot of the problems in this lesson are just something like this. You're given a function, and you're asked to find the indefinite integral uh, of it. Okay. Um, so here, the power rule is going to come into play because we have this x to the fifth. Um, also, um, this is a reverse of what I've been referred to as a coefficient rule for derivatives. If you have a, um, I need a plus c there. Um, because we've seen that if you have a constant times x, like you know, something like 3x, the derivative is just going to be that constant. So now we're going the other way. If you have just a constant as the function you're taking the integral of, then the antiderivative is just the constant times x. Okay. So now I'm going to use these rules for this. OK, so here's our starting point is what we were given. Now, because of the rule for sums, you can break this up into two separate integrals and handle them individually. So I have uh, actually going to, for clarity, I'm going to move this minus four back in here. So here I've just broken it up into two. Within each one, if you have a constant factor, you can pull it out. So I can take a minus four and pull it outside. I can take this five and pull it out, and all that's left is one. So now I can use a power rule on x to the fifth. What do you do? You add one to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. So the integral of x to the fifth is x to the sixth, and then you divide by six. Um, here the uh, integral of one is just going to be x because the derivative of x is one. Um, so those are the integrals of these two functions if they're multiplied by their respective coefficients, the minus four and the minus five. And then we just uh, clean all this up. Uh, don't forget the, uh, the plus C. Now, you don't have to break it down like this. Um, as you get used to doing these, you might find that you can do this all in one shot. Uh, but I'm just showing you um, all the steps of where the answers uh, come from. Any questions about this one? One thing that's uh, quite unfortunate on, um, like on tests and such, is that now you're learning two different sets of rules for different things. You have the rules for derivatives, rules for integrals. Um, on the final exam, you'll be making use of both. And uh, it happens uh, all too often that uh, basically you're going the wrong way. Of a problem asks for a derivative and you do an integral or vice versa. So very important to keep straight. You know, if it's something like this, that's when you're doing an integral. If you're talking, it's talking about rate of change. That's still a derivative. Be sure to keep the rules 
straight for their respective uh, problems. Yeah. All right, here's another um, where we're making use of this rule for um, integral of e to the x is just going to be e to the x. Um, so here I break this up into two. Um, integral of e to the x minus 5 eighths times the integral of 1. So the integral of e to the x is just e to the x. The integral of 1 is just x. Um, and that's it. And don't forget the plus c. By the way, I won't uh, bore you with the details, but there literally is a joke about uh, two mathematicians in a bar and that involves the, the plus C. This one is real quick. Um, it's simply applying the opposite of a coefficient rule for derivatives. The integral of a constant is just the same constant times x. Um, and don't forget the dang plus c. OK, uh, be sure to pay attention to what variable uh, functions are of, and usually it's a function of x, but in this case, it's given to you as a function of t. Um, so we're going to use a power rule for this term, uh, exponential for uh, for this one. So here, uh, again, you don't have to do this, but just for clarity, break it up into two. Um, so we have minus 5 times the integral of e to the t, and then minus 9 times the integral of t. The idea here is I want to make sure that when it's time to actually integrate, what we have behind the integral sign, whatever functions we have, are uh, the simplest ones possible. So we're trying to like, declutter things. So the integral of e to the t is itself. And then this is one that comes up very often. The integral of t is t squared over 2, because you're increasing the exponent by 1. Excuse me. And then dividing by that new exponent. So you're dividing by 2 here. Um, there's certain integrals that have come up very often. Um, so the integral of a constant is just a constant times you know, x or t or whatever variable it is. Um, the integral of x is x squared over 2. That's that's one to just have in front of your mind, just as you're probably very used to, like as a reflex. OK, you have derivative of x squared. It's 2x. Um, that's the same idea. OK, here we have something a little more involved. Um, you're trying to find a specific antiderivative. Um, because there are infinitely many antiderivatives because you can add an, a constant, uh, any constant you want, um, and it's still an antiderivative. But here, we're trying to pick out one that um, satisfies this condition. So. Um, so, so even over infinitely many antiderivatives, only one will satisfy this as well. Um, so this is very, what happens very often in uh, differential equations. You have an equation like this to solve. You're trying to find a function big F whose derivative is this. And um, you have infinitely many solutions to this. And then you pick out the one that satisfies this extra condition. So we have an exponential, so we'll need that rule. And we have an x squared, so we'll need the uh, power rule also. Um, so first, we're just going to find the indefinite integral of this in a way that I've been doing in uh, previous problems. And then we'll account for uh, this condition here. So I have uh, 4 times the integral of x squared minus 6 times the integral of e to the x. And just trying to simplify things behind each integral sign. The integral of x squared is x cubed over 3. That one also comes up very often. Uh, that's just the power rule. 
and then of course the integral of e to the x once again is itself. Uh, so this is so this describes all possible antiderivatives of the given function. Um, so your final answer is going to have this form. We just need to figure out what is the correct value of c in this case. So what you do is we need to make sure that f of zero. Oh, whoops. That should be big F of X. OK. Um, we need to make sure that when we plug X equals zero in here, we get minus five. So I just go ahead and set X equals zero throughout. And see what we get. So this whole expression with a plus C included has to equal minus five. So if I simplify all this so we get nothing from here and then E to the zero, very important. Um, remember, anything to the zero power is one. Um, so, so that's why we have a minus six here. So minus six plus C must equal minus five. So then you um, just add six to both sides, and we find that C needs to be equal to one. So, so if you go back and set c equal one up here, then that's the antiderivative that you want. Then you plug in x equals zero, and you end up with uh, minus five. Um, so that that is the final answer that you would you would enter. Dang it. Um, just as if, as you occasionally have to deal with fractional exponents for derivatives, you need to deal with them for integrals also. Um, this is a power rule either way. Um, so, so we have here, we have, uh, again, just trying to set constants aside. Um, we're going to have minus five times the integral of x to the four fifths. So watch what happens here. Exponent of four fifths, you add one to it. So that's four fifths plus five fifths, which is nine fifths. Um, then remember the power rule, whatever your new exponent is, got to divide by it. But that's the same as multiplying by it flipped. So what we have here, the integral of four fifths is x to the nine fifths times nine fifths flipped, which is five ninths. Um, so, um, so that's how we handle these uh, cases of fractional exponents. Now notice uh, these two fractions are reciprocals of each other because you're dividing by that exponent. So in fact, I'm going to add some elaboration here. Okay, so minus five integral x So what I have here is x to the one-fifth. 
Why is this still not working? Oh, okay. All right. All right, so what happened here is add one to the exponent, um, but it says the exponent is four fifths. That's the same as adding five fifths. And then whatever you have up here for your new exponent, that's what uh, goes down below. And so that's how you get Nine fifths there. And then, as in, as in power rules, since you're dividing by the new exponent, that's what goes down here. But then it's easier to write this way um, dividing by nine fifths is the same as multiplying by five ninths. Um, so, ideally, you want to uh, go from this. to this as quickly as possible. Um, so, so if you work out uh, what the new exponent is, so 4 fifths plus 1 is 9 fifths, and then you just multiply by that flipped. And we're going to see other examples of this as we go for problems. So once we have this antiderivative of x to the 4 fifths worked out, then we just uh, clean up the constants, and then we're done. All right, so now we have uh, this one is going to call for um, using um, the fact that the integral of 1 over y is natural log of absolute value of y. Um, so here I break this up into two integrals for 1 over y and then 2 times the integral of y to the fourth. Um, so here we use this rule to get natural log and don't forget the absolute value of y. And then the integral of y to the fourth is y to the fifth over five. Again, add one by, to the exponent, divide by the exponent. And then the, the customary plus c. Okay, here we have several terms to uh, uh, work out. Um, so again, we break it down into uh, separate integrals, pull out any constant factors in each one. So then we have the integral of x squared here, and then 1 over x here, and then 1 over x to the seventh. So for the first and last ones, we're going to use the power rule. So we have x cubed over 3 coming from the x squared. Again, adding the exponent and dividing by the exponent. 1 over x, the integral of that is natural log. Don't forget the absolute value. And then here, x to the seventh, that's the same as x to the minus seven. So I'll just write it that way. That'll make it easier to see where the next step comes from. You add one to the exponent, which will give you minus six. So I have x to the minus six, and then divide by that, divided by minus six. So just as with derivatives, when you have something like this, it's easier to take the derivative if you write it in this form involving a negative exponent. Same is true for integrals. Except for 1 over x is that's going to go to log x anyway. Um, and then we just uh, clean up the uh, constant factor. So we have minus 8 over minus 6, which gives you plus 4 thirds. Um, and you can either write this as x to the minus 6 like here or uh, have it as x to the 6 down in the denominator. Uh, like as long as you make your meaning clear uh, to Hawks, uh, either one is fine. <clears throat> okay. 
Here's another situation where it's best to write in terms of fractional exponents, and so we don't don't want to deal with radical signs. Um, so here we have x to the one fourth, and then minus eight x to the one half. So that's how this is written here. So just like we saw a few problems ago, add one to the exponent, so one fourth plus four fourths is five fourths, and then you multiply by that flipped, because that's the same as dividing by five fourths. So integral of x to the one fourth is four fifths x to the five fourths. Again, notice how these are reciprocals of each other. That's going to keep happening. Here too, in fact, it happens right here. X to the one half, you add one to the one half, and you get three halves, so then it's two thirds x to the three halves. This one comes up relatively often. Um, so anytime you have the integral of just plain old square root of x, the integral of that is two thirds x to the three halves. So then we um, deal with this uh, multiplied by eight to clean up the constants, and and then you're done. <coughs> Here's another one with multiple terms to deal with. Um, so um, just breaking up into separate integrals and pulling out any constant factors like I've been doing. So we have 9 times integral of e to the x plus 3 integral of x to the fifth and then minus 9 sevenths integral of 1. So I'm going to use the appropriate rules for all three of these terms. So integral of e to the x is just itself. Uh, x to the fifth goes to by power rule x to the 6 over 6, add 1 of the exponent and divide. And then here we have the integral of 1, but that's just x. And then we have uh, 3 over 6, and that gives us a 1 half. All right, for some problems like these where um, this next one, where you have to carry out some algebra first and then uh, apply these uh, integration rules. Um, so, um, so the way this is written, this is not something that would be easy to integrate. But if you distribute the x cubed through all this, then it um, reduces to something that we've seen how to handle. So, so we go ahead and distribute the x cubed through here. So we get 5x to the fourth plus 4x four cubed. So now on each term, we just go ahead and use the power rule. So again, just again, you don't have to do this if you're, when you're working these out on paper. Um, it's like to show where um, the answer, answer comes from. Um, so we have five times integral of x to the fourth plus four integral of x cubed. On each of these, use the power rule. So x to the fourth, we get x to the fifth over five. X cubed gives us x to the fourth over four. Uh, the constant factors conveniently cancel, um, and this is what we're left with. Uh, from old problems, you might some of you might recognize that 4x cubed is a derivative of x to the fourth, therefore the antiderivative of 4x cubed is uh, x to the fourth. Um, here too, there's a little algebra to do first, and then carry out the integration. Because this would not be, this one can be done without this, but it's not something I've shown you. So instead, you can just go ahead and multiply it out, and then you can use things that I have shown you. Um, so here we just uh, foil this out, and this is what we get. So now you can use a, a power rule or cons constant rule on each of these terms. Um, so after breaking it up and factoring out whatever constant factors we have, um, so x squared goes to x cubed over 3, x goes to x squared over 2. So these two in particular uh, will come up very frequently, as we've seen. Uh, integral of 1 is just x. So then you just go ahead and clean up all the constants, um, and then you're done. Um, notice we had a quadratic that we were taking integral of. Uh, the integral of that turned out to be cubic. So that's something that happens in general. If you have a polynomial of a certain degree, 
your antiderivative will be a polynomial of uh, that degree plus one. Our first word problem of this set. Um, you've had problems in the past where uh, you've given something like a cost function and asked for marginal costs, or pro uh, you've tried to find a, pro a profit function if it wants marginal profit. In those cases, you're taking a derivative. Now you are given some marginal function, like uh, marginal revenue in this case, and the idea is to backtrack to the um, uh, original function. So here, we're given marginal revenue and it's asking for revenue. So, so it's these old, old uh, business application problems in reverse. Um, now, it's not enough to simply specify for marginal revenue. You also have to specify what the revenue would be at a certain value of X, where X is the number of units being sold, uh, irons in this case. Um, now, it makes sense that if you don't sell any units, you're not going to get any revenue. So, so this condition needs to be taken into account um, at the end. So first, we're just going to take the antiderivative of this, like in previous problems, and then we'll deal with this. So we fill in our given marginal revenue, and then uh, so the integral of a constant is a constant times x, and then the integral of x is x squared over 2. So that's where this comes from. So then we go ahead and clean up the constants. And this is our revenue function, but not completely specified. We need to make sure if we plug in x equals zero in here, that our overall result is zero. So we go ahead and plug in x equals zero here and get this. And uh, once we simplify as much as we can, uh, that just turns out to be c. And since the overall result is supposed to be zero, that means that c must be zero. Uh, so this is the revenue function. So, so it satisfies the two conditions. If you sell no units, you get no revenue. And if you find a marginal revenue from this, then it's this that was given. Okay, here, similar idea. You're given marginal cost, and I need to uh, backtrack to cost. So, like before, uh, another condition is needed um, that the fixed cost uh, is $1,000. So, so, even if you do not produce any cameras, you're still incurring these uh, fixed costs. Um, so, of course, it would be stupid not to produce any cameras, but anyway. Um, so marginal cost is C prime of X. So now we're going to say that uh, our cost function is the integral of a marginal cost. So go ahead and fill in that marginal cost. Uh, integral 21 is just that times X. And then um, OK. Um, and then the integral of X is X squared over 2. Um, so 0.17 over 2 is uh, 0 0.085. So I'm going to throw an extra step here. Okay. Um, just as, so you can see where that comes from. Um, Um, or you can look at it from this way, 0.17 is 17 over 100, then times one half is 17 over 200, but that's 0.085 if working out in your calculator. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so our cost function has this form, but we have to find the right value of C so that if we plug in X equals zero, the overall result is 1,000 for fixed costs. So we go ahead and, and uh, set 
x equals zero, and we get just c. Uh, since the overall expression must be equal to a thousand, c must be equal to a thousand. So this is our overall cost function. So the marginal cost that we get from taking a derivative of this is equal to this. And then if we set uh, x equals zero, we'll get a fixed cost of a thousand. <clears throat> okay, here we're given the rate of change of growth in population. Um, and, uh, or sorry, I said that wrong. It's, it's, it's the growth rate of a population. Um, rate of change of growth would be second derivative. Um, so population is growing at this rate, um, and you want to find the corresponding uh, function for just the population. Um, so the current population is 9,300. Uh, T refers to years from now. So here you put in your growth rate, um, and uh, so we go ahead and find the antiderivative of that to backtrack to the original population, P of T. So uh, the integral of one is this t, and then we have t to the one half, but you add one to the exponent and get three halves, so the integral is two thirds t to the three halves. Um, so then you handle all of the uh, constants, and this is your population function of this form, but now you gotta make sure that when you substitute t equals zero, you get the current population of 9,300. So you go ahead and set t equals zero, and you get uh, the whole expression becomes just C, therefore C must be 9,300. Um, it's been happening these problems that the constant value C ends up being equal to whatever the initial value is. Um, that does happen a lot. It doesn't happen all the time, though. In fact, the very first problem we had that had initial condition, it did not happen that way, so don't assume. So this is your population function. So. Uh, Take a derivative, the growth rate will be equal to this that was given. If you substitute t equals zero, you get the present population of 9,300. <clears throat> okay. Um, because velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time, if you're given a velocity, you can backtrack to uh, position. Um, now you need an extra condition um, that, that t equals zero of a position is zero. So here's our velocity function. Uh, so distance traveled will be the integral of velocity. Um, Okay, um, so now we go ahead and work this out like we have been. So the integral of t is t squared over two. The integral of t squared is t cubed over three. Uh, so then we uh, simplify the constant factors as much as we can. And this is our function for distance traveled. Um, but we need to make sure that if we plug in t equals zero, we get zero. So we go ahead and plug in t equals zero, and we're left with just c. Therefore, c must be zero. So whatever value is on the right side of this condition, that's what goes on the right side here. Because the left side is your antiderivative with this value, whatever that is, plugged in for your, your variable t in this case. So that is the distance function corresponding to this velocity and this initial condition. So how much, how far has it gone in 14 minutes? You just plug in t equal 14 into your distance function. So you just work all that out on your calculator and this is how far the object has gone, or vehicle in this case. Thank you. 
Okay, here we have uh, exponential, but notice there's a constant multiplying the variable here, e to the point 0.3t. So remember, when you take the integral of this, it's itself divided by the coefficient of your variable. So we have to remember to divide by 0.3 in this case. Um, so here, integral of e to the point 0.3t is itself dividing by the coefficient of t. Um, and you can write your answer in either form, but this, this is the result. So this is a common mistake to forget to divide by that coefficient. Here's another example of that same kind of uh, situation. Uh, we have uh, integral of e to the 2y. So we pull out the minus 5. Integral of e to the 2y is itself divided by 2. Um, and then we just give the constants to get this. All right, here there's a little algebra to do first before evaluating the integral. Um, if you break, you've seen this before, um, like a long time ago, when taking derivatives for the first time. Break this up into separate fractions. Um, actually, I'll put a intermediate step in here. It's about the same as minus x to the fourth over x to the fourth, minus 7x cubed over x to the fourth, minus 6 over x to the fourth. So, so it's breaking up into separate fractions. And then each one can be simplified. So we get minus 1 from here. Uh, here we have x cubed over x to the fourth, so that's just over x. The x cubed cancels, and then nothing no, nothing has changed with this one. Um, but what I can do is it's a good idea to rewrite this last one as instead of 6 over x to the 4, if it's the same as 6x to the minus 4. So now you can apply your various rules. Um, so the integral of 1 is just x, and so we have this minus. The integral of 1 over x is natural log of absolute value of x. Don't forget the absolute value. And then here we have x to the minus 4, but that's the same as x to the minus 3 over minus 3, because you're adding 1 to the exponent, which gives you a minus 3. Um, so then we simplify uh, whatever constant factors we have. So minus 6 over minus 3 gives us plus 2. And then we have this x to the minus 3. So if you have a fraction like this, a very simple denominator, just go ahead and break it up into separate fractions and work on each one individually. Last one. Um, so here we have marginal profit is given to be this. So we want to uh, um, find the right profit function that produces this marginal profit. So, so profit will be the integral of marginal profit. Um, so then we carry out the integral of this. Integral of 1 is just x. Integral of x is x squared over 2. So then our profit function has this form, but if we know how much profit we have from a certain number of units being sold, um, the idea is uh, this profit function would give an idea as to what the profit will be if additional units are sold. So we go ahead and set the 16 units sold, gives us 2,400 profit. Um, so now we substitute x equal to 16. 
and work out what this is. So we, you end up with uh, 5696 plus C, but that must be equal to 2400. Um, because that's a profit for 16 radio sol. So then you use this equation to solve for C. Notice it did not define this value because um, uh, notice the condition here was set at X equals 16. Um, so, so this is what our value of C is. Therefore, this is our uh, profit function. Um, and actually, it makes sense it would be negative because suppose you don't sell any, so X is zero. It makes sense that your profit would be negative because you've already incurred fixed costs. So then you find out, okay, what happens if you um, sell 60 radios? So you just go ahead and plug in 60 into your newfound profit function. And this is what we wind up with. Okay, so, so these are how you use uh, various uh, uh, integration rules uh, to backtrack from marginal functions, like for um, you know, profit or revenue or cost, uh, back to uh, the original, uh, or from uh, given velocity, finding the um, uh, distance or displacement function. So do you want to have any questions about any of these? OK, I'll stop recording at this point, and that is all for today. Just one lesson to go.